policy, which is almost about 120 years old anyway. Um, for a long time, um, the United States has regulated um, undesirable, or what was deemed as undesirable populations from entering the country. In 1917, um, immigration did not have a sort of form concept of what a homosexual was. Um, in fact, most of the world, in the United, well, certainly most of the people in the United States, which is the pretense here, right, um, wouldn't have had a sort of crystallized concept of what a homosexual um, looked like. However, that did not stop immigration policy in 1917 from excluding people who were, quote, mentally defective or had a constitutional psychopathic inferiority. The best way, however, that most, that is the most effective way that immigration policy in the United States restricted people who were read as gender or sexual nonconforming um, was actually by, by people who would, quote, um, pose a kind of burden to the state, right? People who might seem a kind of, um, uh, a kind of impediment, sort of challenge um, to the United States' own welfare system. The United States officially includes homosexuality. Um, we see it happen in 1952 in the McCarran-Walter Act. Um, aliens afflicted with a psychopathic personality, epilepsy, or a mental defect. In this context, it's really important for us to understand that the American Psychological Association, the APA, still considered homosexuality a mental disease until 1973. Um, to complicate matters a little bit further, immigration in the United States doesn't look to the APA. It actually looks at the Public Health Service, the PHS, and they took even longer to remove homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. Um, this goes to court in 1965. Um, they clarify exactly what they mean by psychopathic personality, and they include sexual deviation from the people who would be excluded from entering the United States, um, very clearly um, trying to regulate those who are being desirable or undesirable from entering the United States. So what on earth is the United States going to do as a result of Marie, right? This poses a massive challenge for, for the state, right? For both states, right? Um, what something on one side of the Florida Straits allowed you to come into the United States, once you're here, you face deportation. Um, we, of course, know this, this history, right? Uh, 11,000 people uh, stormed the... the La, La Bajala, right, the, the, the sort of Peruvian embassy, um, in just a span of just a few months, we see 125,000 Cubans enter. This is where I want to focus, like I told us, a little bit on um, some of the images that are coming from Granma. Um, and it took me a long time to find these in English, but of course I have the Spanish versions at home too. Um, so this is the Mariel Volks gun. This is, of course, coming from, from Granma. Um, and here we see uh, Fidel Castro um, as the, as the um, boat lift is ongoing. Um, and the Peruvian embassy here, right, the sort of metaphor for the Marielitos, sort of garbage, right, that's entering by way of the, of the boat lift. Um, and a very strange looking Jimmy Carter, right, um, welcoming him famously, right, with open arms and, and an open heart. But what's in a name, which is the kind of the, the sort of concept that I want to keep on turning to? This is really interesting, right? On one side of the Florida Straits to Fidel Castro, um, these are criminals, right? The sort of reframing of these peoples as criminals, as undesirables, as the lumpen proletariat, la, la coria, right? Um, la basura, um, la usano. Um, but on the other side, and this is what Fidel Castro is pointing to in this image, um, he's saying that to the United States, these same people are being reframed as dissidents, right? Um, and he's saying, what's, what's, what exactly is the, the, the sort of point here? What's, what's happening here? The last image I'll, I'll show you here, um, an even goofier looking Jimmy Carter, right? Um, as the boat lift is ongoing, um, and he's carrying a scum cake, a, here a metaphor for the Mariolitos, um, and he's talking to Secretary of State Edmund Muskie, saying, what on earth are we going to do with this cake, right, the sort of scum cake that we don't really want? Um, and in the back, you can see Fidel Castro um, saying, you have to eat this cake that you wanted, right, all by yourself. You're going to have to split this cake um, with no one else but yourself. You get, you get the scum here. Last, oh, I thought I had one last time. So I do have one last time. <laughs> um, and this one's coming from, from the Charlotte Observer. Um, and this is actually done by the Federation of American Immigration Reform, better known as FAIR, an anti-immigrant group, a restrictionist group that still is quite popular today, um, that is uh, still kind of prevalent today. Um, and here they, they kind of caption um, an existing image from the Charlotte Observer saying, as many as 40,000 criminals, homosexuals, and mentally defective persons are excludable under U.S. immigration law, right? Officially, are still excludable under U.S. immigration law. May have come to the United States in the Mario boat lift, so on and so forth. Um, of course, here the image is of, of significance to us too, right? The, this is a kind of play on words. This is not only the United States' um, kind of biggest import, right, or thought to be kind of the most important, right, the cigars, of Cuban cigars, right? Um, 
But here, the very fact that they defected is kind of implicit here, but also that they are defective, right? That these people, there's something wrong with them. They have both defected and that they have, um, that they're in some way defective. So, on the both sides of this Florida Strait, in Cuba, these are the lumpen proletariat, right? The words that Marx and Engels will use to talk about the dregs of society, those that the, will never be able to conform or really make sense or contribute to the, to the glorious revolution, um, as, as Castro would put this. Um, here, they're anti-revolutionaries, they're criminals, they're scum. But these very same people on the other side, which is, of course, what Fidel was talking about, right? When, um, in that, that sort of the, the, the comic we just looked at. Um, they're anti-communists, they're refugees, they're cold warriors. Um, and in later years, the, the queer community in particular would even be referred to as the sort of sex mm -hmm. right? The exiles who, in some ways, were being, um, leaving the country as way of their sexuality. To complicate matters just a little bit further, as if there wasn't enough going on, a month before Marie, the United States, after a great deal of pressure from the international community, um, particularly the United Nations, had to redefine what it meant to be a refugee in the United States. Um, and they passed the 1980 Refugee Act. And as you can see here, it's redefined as one, that is for really a long time the United States was kind of seen as being insincere in its own policy, um, as not really, um, essentially, right, that the, the refugee in the United States context meant that you were fleeing communism. Um, and there was a sort of larger push to think about, to rethink what refugee means, um, perhaps if you're fleeing a right-wing country, for instance, right? You are much more likely, of course, to receive um, refugee asylum policy or benefit from refugee asylum policy if you're fleeing communism. So they redefine it. One fleeing persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, member in a particular social group, and of course this is what is of interest to me in this, poli in, in this presentation today, um, or political opinion. So what's going to happen to all these, these queer marilitos? Here's a, a queer marilito in one of the, this is in Pennsylvania, one of the four temporary camps um, where unsponsored marilitos were sent. Um, and here he's pointing to a Spanish, un aviso importante, um, by way of the colonel, that he's not allowed, that he's pointing to, um, and by the way, these are segregated barracks, that is, all the queers um, who were read as queer or self-identified as queer were put in one particular barrack. There, there seems to have been two in Pennsylvania in particular. And they go into great detail saying what it is these queer marilitos cannot do, really informed by that INS policy, right, um, that they could actually face deportation. They can't wear women's clothing, they can't wear eyeshadow or makeup or um, wear, you know, all sorts of different things, right, there's explicit detail. A few minutes later, we see that they don't care at all, <laughs> right? They're actually camping it out in the middle of the camps, right? This is a really kind of flamboyant, queer moment. They're actually standing in front of that, right? I mean, it's that, that very sign that says you could face deportation um, if you are openly, right, um, claiming to be, to be a homosexual. One of these, one of these marilitos is wearing a makeshift dress. One of them seems to have just gotten a perm. Um, all sorts of kind of weird um, representations, right, in terms of, um, that is flamboyant presentations, right, in terms of the United States' own gaze of these people. What to do with all these people who are so openly, right, um, talking about their sexuality, despite the fact that the United States officially, right, by way of its own statute, still says that we will not welcome it. So what happens? A number, for a long time, for several years at this point, the United States, particularly through the lobbying of a, of a new politicized gay and lesbian movement in the United States, had been fighting to get rid of um, what they read as a kind of archaic, of course, um, policy in the United States. Um, the Mariel exodus gives them a sort of new impetus, a new motivation to help alter this policy. Um, what ends up happening through my own research, both in Cuba and, in, and throughout the United States, um, we see that not a single Mariolito or Marilita um, was deported because of his or her sexuality. Um, that is, the United States ultimately passes um, what I call a kind of proto-don't-ask-don't-tell policy. We usually think about proto-don't-ask-don't-tell in terms of mi military policy. Um, but actually there was a sort of earlier version of that in terms of immigration. That is, after the Justice Department, through a great deal of pressure, as a result of all these marilitos who are openly coming and, and they just don't know what to do with them, right? They're so public. Um, they're, these are uh, talking about this in the Miami Herald, they're talking about it in gay magazines, The Advocate, and there's a great deal of political pressure suddenly on the United States to change this policy. And they change it unofficially. That is, they actually pass these memos saying that from now on, we will no longer kind of... Uh, 
ask people at the border, should someone have a gay pride button, for instance, or be caught with a, a kind of gay periodical or something, no longer would the United States and the border, at least um, officially, as they were not meant to, they were, they're not supposed to anymore, not allowed to anymore, um, question whether that person, right, was homosexual or not. Um, this was changed massive, really important policy for all um, people who are queer foreigners, right, entering the United States. This has massive implications. This stays in policy officially for, um, for another 10 years. It's in 1990 that the United States officially removes that ban. Um, I should also note that another significant part of the story, it's only in 2010 that the United States removes the ban of people who are HIV positive um, or, or living with AIDS um, as people who are restricted from entering the United States. So ultimately what happens, right, as a result of Marielle, is that these anti-communism, right, the sort of rhetoric of anti-communism, the fact that these people, the Marielitos, were Cubans fleeing communism, um, ultimately trumped a long-standing homophobic immigration policy, right? That is this sort of, um, this sort of rhetoric of, this, in this heated moment in the Cold War, really superseded um, this long-standing anti-gay policy. Um, and I'll end just from this last image, and this is what my, the, most of my research since then has, um, I'm particularly interested in sexuality as it relates to immigrant uh, communities in the United States. Most recently I've been looking at the early 20th century and the Bahamians who built Miami, uh, many who were, who were policed in a number of different ways. But of course this takes place in really important and interesting ways in a city, right, an international city like Miami. Um, we see here, for instance, this is um, in the 1980 uh, election rally, this is in the middle of Liberty City, and here we see a, a protester, a, a gay, a, a lesbian protester, Melody Moorhead, um, carrying a, a placard, a poster, um, and one of the things that she's arguing against, um, you know, Carter's own policies is that he favored an anti-gay immigration policy, um, which of course remains so critical to the lesbian and gay community in Miami then and, and remains so today. Um, and with that, thank you so much. different presentation for all of you. At the time the Mario Boat lived, I was co-owner of Hialeah Convalescent Home. Now. After volunteering with my partner one weekend early in the event, by Sunday, it appeared there were plenty of volunteers. So we went back to Hialeah. However, at 6 a.m. the following Tuesday, I received a call from Dr. James Howell, the then director of the Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services for the state. He said, most of the volunteers had gone home Sunday afternoon, and it appeared as though thousands of refugees were on their way. The federal government had asked the state to manage the event and not embarrass the president. It was an election year, and things were already complicated by the 54 hostages for whom Carter was negotiating. We later learned that Carter was negotiating with Castro at this time for release of prisoners through an appeal to the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was a good friend of Castro. Dr. Howell asked if we could assist in coordinating volunteer medical services. We spent the next 20 days and 22 hour days until the federal government took over. In an interview after the boat lift with Gennaro Perez, an undercover agent who penetrated the General Directorate of Intelligence and operated under cover of Havana Tour, a DGI run travel agency in Miami, that maintained surveillance of Cuban Americans visiting Cuba. Hmm. According to Perez, boat lift was a long, part of a long-range plan consisting of two parts. The Mario boat lift was not intended to occur spontaneously as it did. According to Perez, Plan A called for the normalization of United States-Cuba relations, which obviously did not imply changing the totalitarian character of Castro government, Cast Cuba's alliance with the Soviet Union, or Castro's active support of radical third world movements. The objective of Plan A was to reduce the cost to the Soviet Union of the embargo on Cuba. If Plan A failed, backup Plan B aimed at a more aggressive policy of destabilizing the United States, and would include, as components, the release of Cuba's increasing internal socio-economic and political pressure through a massive outflow of Cuban boat people towards the United States. 
infiltration of Cuban agents, discrediting of the Cuban community in the United States, essentially dividing the Cuban community, increasing criminal activity, getting rid of undesirable persons, and obtaining funds in U.S. currency. Cuba followed Part A during most of the Carter administration when the normal normalization process reached its highest point with the establishment of interest sections in each of the two nations' capitals. Carter was convinced that he could moderate Castro's foreign and domestic policies by offering him the possibility of full diplomatic and economic relations with the United States. The Cuban interest section in Washington, however, became largely a cover for intelligence operations, with the vast majority of its ten members consisting of intelligence agents. The drive appeared successful in 1977 with the formation of a group of prominent Cuban Americans who called themselves the Committee of 75. The group's primary purpose was to initiate a dialogue with Castro, a project said to have been originated with Castro, to reduce the staunch opposition to normalization of the increasingly powerful Cuban exile community. As the story goes, Bernardo Benes, president of Miami's Continental Bank, also an important member of the Cuban Jewish community, took a trip to Panama. Upon arriving, he learned that the Cuban consul was an old friend of his. Both realized they wanted to improve relationships between Cuba and the United States, specifically between Cuba and the Cuban Americans in Miami. Venice called Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, who was a close friend, and the two discussed the idea. But Castro's plan was served a blow. There were allegations that Venice was a Cuban intelligence agent and engaging in personal dealings with Castro. Venice lost credibility with the Castro exiles. Further problems developed when Castro reneged on his commitment to remove troops from Angola, compelling the Carter administration to retreat from the normalization process. Part B. The initial tactic in the late 70s employed special charter companies established to permit Cuban Americans to visit relatives in Cuba, bringing them cash and other necessities. Rates for these flights were extremely expensive. During his indictment, Hilda Romeo admitted to diverting hundreds of thousands of U.S. dollars to Cuba. Part of the process was to exchange U.S. currency that tourists brought into Cuba with Cuban pesos. When the individuals returned to the United States, they would convert the pesos into counterfeit dollars. Another ploy brought counterfeit money in diplomatic pouches. Once in the United States, the money was exchanged for real currency and returned to Cuba. Another component, Plan B, was infiltration of Equifax, a retail credit reporting firm, allowing the Cuban government to review the financial status of Cuban Americans. Tour operator Lourdes Do Pico, whose Cuba travel and Canaveral travel provided tours to Cuba, was involved in the working at Central Credit, a credit rating firm for businesses. The fact that the United States had an economic blockade as well as a trade embargo against Cuba made knowing the economic potential of exiles in the United States very valuable. They created a dossier on the Cubans according to how they spent their money. The Reverend Manuel Espinoza became a double agent working with the DGI and the Miami Police Department Elite Strategic Intelligence Unit as well as Equifax. He indicated the purpose of these actions was for Cuban governments to be able to determine what requests could be realistically made of them, of the Cuban Americans, if they requested release of their families in Cuba. During the boat lift, those with money were targeted for bribes, often in tens of thousands of dollars. In many cases, the refugees were in the United States. The exiles responsible for bringing them were economically unable to support them, having spent all of their savings and exhausting their loan capacity to bring them in the first place. Another effort to manipulate the Cuban-American community was the placement of Cuban DGI agent Elsa Prieto at Dade County's Jackson Memorial Hospital, allowing, allowing access to the hospital's mental patients' records. This information was transmitted to other Cuban agents and utilized to extort Cuban-American leaders. Prieto was identified by Espinoza as a member of the Antonio Maceo Brigade, 
several members of which were allegedly involved with Alice Featherstone, inciting violence in the black community. Prieto and her husband, Carlo Alvarez, a professor at Florida International University, were charged with espionage and sentenced to prison. Castro also sent his agents to establish a network of cocaine and marijuana trafficking. Colombian drug czar Pablo Escobar had established his headquarters in Cayo Paridan Grande off the northern coast of Cuba in partnership with the Cuban government. They provided the Medellin cartel with equipment and chemical material such as acetone and ethyl ether. These substances are basic ingredients to produce cocaine hydrochloride. It was later determined that Veradero was not selected for the boat lift as planes from Colombia landed there with their load of cocaine offloaded to mother ships who proceeded to place on feeder boats from the Bahamas and Florida. Under the protection of the Cuban Navy, Cuban Coast Guard, boats proceeded flying the Cuban flag as Cuban radar monitored U.S. Coast Guard cars and helped the boats evade them. It was later learned that monitored from a location in Pembroke Pines, Florida, which may have had links to the Colombian terrorist group M19, the cocaine smuggling ring also had access to top secret radio frequencies, including Air Force One, U.S. Army missile bases, and NASA. For years, the U.S. government officials, including those in the Department of Defense and the CIA, were deliberately misguided about Cuba. Annabelle Montes was an analyst with the U.S. Department of Defense while working for the Cuban government. She offered misleading opinions and skewed everything that came across her desk while working as the DOD's top Cuban affairs expert. They believed in her, and so anybody who said anything different, everyone said, oh, no, no, no. In 2001, the FBI discovered Montes' treacherous activities she was indicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Starting in May 1979, discontented Cubans perpetrated a rash of spectacular escapes into Latin American embassies in Havana. Then on April 1, 1980, Hector San Eustace, an unemployed Cuban bus driver, along with five accomplices, attempted to drive a bus through the gates of the Peruvian embassy to secure asylum. He made a mistake, turned too soon, he backed up, and drove a few more yards and ran through the gates. Cuban guards fired on the bus, wounded San Eustace, and in the crossfire, wounded and killed one of their own guards. The Peruvian embassy refused to acquiesce to Cuban demands to return the embassy refugees. An enraged Castro, in an angry tirade to Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley, vowed to turn this shit against the United States. He removed the guards from the embassy and invited anyone who wanted to leave to do so. The response was overwhelmingly embarrassing to Castro. Retrospectively, Castro believed that Carter would do as Johnson did in 1965 and establish an airlift. Napoleon Villaboa, who was subsequently identified as a Cuban agent, was staying at the Rivi Havana Riviera Hotel at the time. A Cuban agent knocked on Villaboa's door at the hotel and announced that Castro wanted to see him. They took the elevator to the 20th floor, where Castro waited in a suite. Fizel was violent, desperate. He said, come here, Chico. What do you think we should do with these embassy people? Villaboa suggested a Camarioca-type solution. He suggested Varadero as a port of departure, but was shot down by Castro. As previously stated, since Veradero was utilized for cocaine transport activities. Days later, his contacts told him Numero Uno, Castro, said the plan was on from the port of Mariel. Mariel was, ironically, the site where Soviet missiles arrived during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Villapoa went to Mariel with several small vessels and brought family members back. Then, per Castro's direction, he went on the radio and invited any member who wished to bring their relatives to the United States to come and get them. When the Refugee Act of 1980 took effect on April 1, 1980, it set a limit of 16,500 refugees per year. 
That figure jumped to 19,000 after the United States agreed to take 2,500 of the 10,000 asylum seekers in the Peruvian embassy. According to the White House, none of the people who came after this counted against these numbers because they did not have legal status as refugees. By May 6, the United States did not limit the number of Cuban refugees permitted to enter. In addition, it committed the United States to taking steps for guaranteeing Cuban safety and comfort once they left the island waters. They also considered a new refugee classification, amnesty applicant, enabling them to remain in the United States and receive federal aid. Although the government determined the refugees did not have legal status, approximately 36,500 Cuban refugees were permitted to enter the United States as of May 11, the day I left. During his July 1980 visit to Nicaragua, Castro declared, we have agents all over the United States who are ready to undertake whatever actions are necessary at the time of our choosing. The Yankees cannot even begin to imagine the capabilities we have in our country. You all read about the racial riots in Miami. We can accomplish things that would make the racial riots in Miami look like a sun shower. In the late 80s, this became more evident. The most destructive fallout from the boat lift affecting Florida and the nation was disclosed prior to and during Manuel Noriega's indictment. Arturo Cobo, who was a double agent working with Sergio Pinon of the Miami Police Elite Strategic Intelligence Unit, provided information regarding Noriega's pilot, Tony Eisperoff, who was in prison. The intelligence, indica intelligence indicated that Eisperoff used to transport Noriega to Cuba. Cuba relayed evidence, Cobo relayed evidence that Noriega had paid $10 million to Cuba to operate in Cuban airspace with the cooperation of the Cuban government. Cuba also conducted an operation called MC, directed by Antonio LaGuardia. Some people called it convertible money. In Cuba, they called it marijuana and cocaine, MC. After Castro's operation was detected and he knew he was going to be indicted for smuggling, he accused the people from MC of being involved in drug smuggling to divert attention from the fact that he, Castro, had authorized the whole thing. De La Guardia was executed, Minister of Interior Jose Brantes poisoned in prison. Hmm. Prophetically, 30 years later, Bob Wilkerson, who at the time of the boat lift was Assistant Director of the Department of Community Affairs and subsequently opened his own consultant firm with specialized in international restructuring of corporate and national organizations, speculated following the Mario boat lift about the situation in Cuba and its relations with the Cuban-American community in Miami. Pub notes, I think there is a real question of what will happen on the day Castro actually dies. I think that it's a very scary time. You know a new democracy. I work with five new democracies. It's part of the quandary you get into. How do you separate the bad guys who are bad guys simply because that was the only way to deal with their situations? The criminals, who wouldn't have been criminals in any other system, but they are still convicts. We're going to see in Cuba, because of its proximity to South Florida, the same difficulties you saw in Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and Poland. There are going to be people in the new government who came out of the old government. It's going to take a gradual social adaptation. And my perceived feeling is that Miami and Havana will become twin cities. The cities will be in parallel and successful families in Miami will create successful operations in Havana. And they will in essence become a sort of seed to bring about the rekindling of economic stability in Cuba. It's not a momentary process, and it's not a sweet one, and it's going to be tough on a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists, and especially for keeping to uh, the time constraints. We will now then turn to a question and answer period, and uh, I 
<coughs> we'll bring you the microphone. Before we do that, let me just uh, tell you what the rules are, uh, uh, which is, uh, first of all, be very brief, as brief as you can 